Set just inside the unassuming facade of an ordinary-looking factory, amid a sea of ordinary-looking factories on the outskirts of Atlanta, Hermius is pushing the very limits of hypersonic aviation. But while most of the companies to get hypersonic contracts from the U.S. Air Force are focused on hypersonic missiles, Hermius is building hypersonic aircraft. I recently got to tour Hermius's classified Atlanta facility, where they're hard at work developing their quarter horse technology demonstrator and their dark horse, hypersonic military aircraft. Let's talk about what I learned and what they're up to in there. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Yeah, we ran out of patience for your love with the cold hard hatred. Before we get started, I want to let you guys know that while I was at the Hermius facility, I jumped on their podcast with everyone's favorite hypersonics expert, Dr. Chris Combs. You can see our hour-long discussion on hypersonics, deterrence, and everything else on their YouTube channel. I'll make sure to include a link below. Now let's get into it, because in recent years, defense discussions have been dominated by what many call the hypersonic arms race, or a competition between global competitors to field the fastest and most maneuverable missiles ever to fly. With international prestige and maybe even the future of warfare on the line, China, Russia, and the United States have reached back into their old bag of tricks. Russia has taken to rebranding dated systems to capitalize on trending buzzwords. The U.S. has taken to pouring boatloads of money onto more than 70 advanced new hypersonic weapons programs. And China has taken the apparent lead, adding hypersonic missiles to its growing portfolio of anti-ship weapon systems all designed to keep American supercarriers at bay. The truth is, the word hypersonic is probably one of the most confusing terms in media discourse today. Thanks to multiple real or misconstrued definitions in common use, Technically speaking, hypersonic is a word we'd use to describe an object traveling fast enough to affect the basic chemistry of the air it interacts with. And since that tends to start happening at around Mach 5, we tend to call Mach 5 the hypersonic barrier, even though there's no actual barrier at all. And while there are a few other similar definitions in common use today, none of these definitions actually describe modern hypersonic missiles. You see, hypersonic missiles do indeed travel at speeds in excess of Mach 5, but it's not that speed alone that makes them special. As we've covered time and time again on this channel, ballistic missiles have been flying at hypersonic speeds since their very inception with Germany's V-2 rocket all the way back in World War II. What makes modern hypersonic missiles different from these fast-moving weapons isn't that they're faster, but rather that they can maneuver while traveling at those high speeds. That's the difference between an air-launched ballistic missile like Kinzel that's misrepresented as a hypersonic weapon and a genuine modern hypersonic weapon like China's DFZF. One flies along a predictable ballistic flight path, leaving it susceptible to intercept, while the other can change trajectory unpredictably, making it nearly impossible to intercept while traveling at these speeds. But the biggest problem with hypersonic missiles is their cost. According to one Pentagon report, the hypersonic missiles the U.S. has in active development may cost as much as $106 million apiece. And it goes without saying that you can only use these missiles once. Now, for America's competitors in Russia and China who have fielded hypersonic deterrent weapons, paying a premium for these missiles isn't that bad a deal. After all, if you're China and you're aiming to sink a $13 billion aircraft carrier, a $100 million missile is a bargain. And Russia's avant-garde is a purpose-built nuclear payload delivery vehicle for its latest ICBM, the RS-28 Sarmat. And it goes without saying that if the world's nuclear powers are exchanging ICBMs, there won't be many of us left after to worry about budgets. But for the United States, that cost begs some serious questions about the actual value of hypersonic weapons in the American arsenal. 
China's navy doesn't have the logistical means to reach American shores, and America's nuclear arsenal, including a new ICBM program underway, have no concerns about defeating Russian air defenses. As a result, we're talking about fielding $100 million missiles with very few targets worthy of such an investment. But if you could field a hypersonic system that could be reused, well, that would change everything. And that brings us to Hermius, which was established in 2018 with the admittedly lofty goal of fielding hypersonic aircraft for the commercial sector, with the long-term goal of even ferrying passengers across the Pacific in as little as 90 minutes. Now, that's certainly ambitious, but in itself, it's not necessarily unique. There have been lots of high-speed aircraft programs over the years. You see, the thing that makes Hermia special isn't that they're reaching for the stars, but rather how firmly they're keeping their feet planted on the ground as they do. Hermes has gone out of their way to not invent anything that they don't have to, opting for off-the-shelf components whenever possible. And when they do need to invent new components, they leverage a wide variety of advanced 3D printers. In fact, I think I saw more 3D printers in their factory than I saw people, some of which were legitimately printing in titanium using high-powered lasers, and all of this makes the iterative design process that much cheaper. Anytime you make a change to your design, you don't have to talk to subcontractors and change contracts or tooling. All you have to do is change the design and print out another part. And if that change doesn't do the trick, you can change it again and print it again. And in keeping with that cost-effective approach, Hermes has opted not to power their hypersonic aircraft with the latest and most exotic form of hypersonic propulsion, scramjets. Instead, Hermes has opted for the older and more mature ramjet technology. Now, this decision could potentially limit Hermes's aircraft to speeds of Mach 6 or below, but at that speed, with maneuverability, Hermes's aircraft would be just as difficult to intercept as the latest and greatest hypersonic missile, but all in a reusable package. And while we're talking engines, let's delve a bit deeper into the cornerstone of Hermes's ongoing hypersonic efforts, their turbine-based combined cycle engine called Chimera. Now, we've talked about turbine-based combined cycle engines on this channel before, and in their simplest form, they're just two different types of air-breathing jet engines laid down in succession, one that's good for low speed and one that's good for high. Now, the traditional turbofan and turbojet engines that power today's aircraft all use a compressor and fan at the front that sucks air in and compresses it before mixing it with fuel and igniting it for propulsion out the back. Now, this compressor allows these engines to function even when the aircraft is at a dead stop, and these engines can continue to accelerate an aircraft all the way up to right around Mach 3, but not much beyond that. Now, ramjets, on the other hand, have no compressors or really moving parts at all. Instead, they rely on the pressure of air flowing into the intake at high speed to provide their compression, and as a result, these engines just straight up don't work at a dead stop. To manage airflow, ramjets use an interior body mounted right in the intake that forces the air to flow around it and slows it to subsonic speeds as it pours into the combustion chamber to be mixed with fuel and ignited. Now, ramjets may not work at a dead stop, but at right around Mach 3, the inflowing air pressure is sufficient for a ramjet to really come alive, and these engines can continue to accelerate aircraft all the way past Mach 5 and likely as high as Mach 6. Now, supersonic combustion ramjets, or scramjets, the latest and greatest in hypersonic propulsion, take that ramjet concept even further by removing that inner body completely and allowing the air to flow through the engine at supersonic speeds instead. Now, as a result, scramjets are capable of sustaining even higher speeds, likely in excess of Mach 10 and maybe much, much higher. But scramjets are also notoriously difficult to work with. Managing to produce sustained ignition in an engine with supersonic air flowing through it has been likened to trying to keep a match lit in a hurricane. And while scramjets have been around for years, nobody has managed to field a scramjet propulsion system for anything other than single-use technology demonstrators to date. 
The older ramjet technology, however, has found its way into a number of platforms, including Europe's Meteor air-to-air -air missile. But the truth is, every platform powered by either ramjets or scramjets so far have all been one-time use. Because these engines don't function at low speeds, they're usually carried aloft via conventional rocket booster before separating and engaging once they're flying high enough and fast enough to function. But because these engines can't function at those lower speeds, they can't slow down to land and instead always crash. So the way these systems are leveraged today tends to be in missiles, where you can make good use of that crash. But a combined cycle engine with both a turbofan and a ramjet or scramjet could theoretically take off under its own power, accelerate up to around Mach 2.8 or 3, transition to the ramjet or scramjet for hypersonic flight, and then upon its return, switch back to that turbofan to slow down and come in for a conventional landing. Sounds easy anyway. There's just one problem. So far, nobody has managed to do it. And that's not for a lack of trying. Lockheed Martin's SR-72 concept, as exemplified by the Dark Star aircraft featured in Top Gun Maverick, has long sought to field a combined cycle turbofan scramjet system. And they're not the only one. The Air Force Research Laboratory's Mayhem program aims to field something very similar. Now, theoretically speaking, the aircraft that eventually emerged from these efforts might be capable of flying at speeds in excess of Mach 10. But the operative questions we should be asking about these programs are when and for how much. Now, at this point, it's impossible to know how much Lockheed Martin has invested into their combined cycle turbofan scramjet concept. But we know for certain that they've been working with Aerojet Rocketdyne on it since at least 2018. As for the Air Force Research Lab's Mayhem program, back in 2022, they awarded Leidos a $334 million contract to continue development on their concept with the eventual goal of fielding a flying prototype maybe by the end of 2028. And this is where Hermius's down-to-earth approach to innovation really shines. Rather than focus on developing a combined cycle scramjet that may exceed Mach 10 years from now after tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars, Hermius's use of ramjet technology could allow them to field the fastest jet ever to fly by the end of next year. And to look just a bit further down that road, with any luck, Hermius could have a reusable, operational hypersonic aircraft in service with the U.S. Air Force at right along the same timeline as Mayhem aims to field a prototype. And maybe craziest of all, thanks to this cost-effective approach to using off-the-shelf components, Hermius believes they can field these hypersonic aircraft for right around the same per-unit price as the DoD's estimates for hypersonic missiles. Now, a lot of Hermius's cost-effective approach to engine design started with the General Electric J8521 turbojet. Now, this small but proven engine has been flying for decades, with its earliest iterations dating all the way back to 1954 when it was used to power the GAM-72 Green Quail missile decoy. But over the years, the J-85 has been a part of a ton of aviation programs and even production aircraft. Over the years, you could find J-85s in the Cessna A-37 Dragonfly that flew attack missions during the Vietnam War, in the Have Blue technology demonstrator that ultimately led to the F-117 Nighthawk. Heck, if you want another Top Gun reference, J-85s power the Northrop F-5 that stood in as the fictional MiG-28 in the original Top Gun. And to give you a little context about how economically efficient Hermius has been throughout development of Chimera, they managed to design, build, and test this engine around the J-85 in just 21 months and for just $18 million. Now, yeah, to me, $18 million sounds like a lot of money. But for context, back in 2020, the Pentagon awarded GE $394 million just for material support operating their J-85-powered aircraft. 
At just 18 inches wide and 45 inches long, the J85 is surprisingly small in person, and to be honest, so is Hermes's Chimera that was built around it, though obviously quite a bit longer thanks to its inline ramjet. And as I walked around poking at this thing, I couldn't help but think about how it does seem to take a philosophical page from the now legendary turbo ramjet that once powered the SR-71 Blackbird. You see, the Pratt & Whitney J58 turbojet that powered the Blackbird used six bypass tubes that started at the fourth stage of its compressor. They'd funnel the air past the ignition chamber and directly into the jet's afterburner, allowing it to function a lot like a ramjet, which is why we tend to call it a turbo ramjet. And if you follow me on TikTok, you can even find a video of me excitedly explaining this to my five-year-old daughter when we came across a J-58 at a museum, and her doing her level best to humor me. Now, Chimera takes that design concept to the next level. Instead of using six bypass tubes, it has a large diverter in the intake that, when closed, funnels all of the inflowing airflow around the turbojet engine and directly into the ramjet behind it. Basically, the turbojet itself becomes the ramjet's inner body that slows the inflowing air to subsonic speeds for ignition. And this is not theoretical. Hermes has already successfully demonstrated the ability to transition from turbojet to ramjet power in the Notre Dame Turbo Machinery Laboratory wind tunnel in South Bend, Indiana this past November. Now, in 2021, Hermes unveiled a full-scale mock-up of their quarter-horse technology demonstrator, and despite being able to put on one hell of a show by powering up its afterburning engine, it was far from a flying prototype. But things are getting exciting in the Hermes factory. As you watch this, Hermes is actively building their first legitimate quarter-horse platform, with the intent of using it for ground testing later this year. And if all goes well, a second quarter horse demonstrator currently at an earlier stage of production will follow behind to begin full-scale flight testing next year. Now, quarter horse is a semi-autonomous and remotely piloted aircraft, and as I toured Hermes's facility, I got the chance to walk into the flat black shipping container that they've built into a mobile quarter horse cockpit and headquarters complete with massive screens on the wall, flight controls, and a bevy of additional computers and servers and electronics, all dedicated to tracking every aspect of the aircraft's performance during testing. If all goes well, Quarter Horse will achieve Mach 4 flight by the end of 2024, or maybe more realistically sometime in 2025. And at that point, Quarter Horse will be the fastest air-breathing jet ever to fly. But Mach 4, and even Chimera and Quarter Horse itself, are all just the beginning. Just before I arrived at Hermes' facility, they'd taken delivery on a massive and powerful Pratt & Whitney F100 afterburning turbofan engine. This thing was no joke. It is four times longer and twice the diameter of the J85 at the heart of Chimera, and with all that added size comes a big boost in power. Ten times that of the J85 at just shy of 30,000 pounds of thrust. Now, this long-serving engine has already been proven in combat, powering both F-15s and F-16s, and now Hermes aims to use it as the basis for their even larger and more powerful combined cycle engine that they're calling Chimera II. Like the original, Chimera II will marry the massive F-100 to an even larger ramjet, allowing for greater speeds and, importantly, payloads. Now, Chimera II is ultimately going to power Hermes's next aircraft being designed specifically for military applications, a platform they call Dark Horse. Now, just like Quarter Horse, Dark Horse will be able to take off and land using regular runways using its traditional jet engine. It'll then transition to ramjet power at right around Mach 2.8 or so. This aircraft is still in the very early stages of design, and Hermia COO Skylar Schuford tells me that Dark Horse may potentially be powered by two of these combined cycle engines to provide the highest payload and reliability possible. 
Now, Hermias' team is reluctant to speak on behalf of the Air Force about what they may ultimately need out of Dark Horse, but it's safe to say that Uncle Sam is already pretty interested in what they have to offer. In 2021, the Air Force awarded Hermias $60 million for continued development on hypersonic propulsion systems, and then in 2022, the Air Force awarded them a second contract aimed at using their hypersonic aircraft to support its advanced battle management system or ABMS, and that contract could ultimately be worth almost a billion dollars. So let's close by talking about how Dark Horse could be leveraged by the American military apparatus. As we've already discussed, speed alone is not what makes hypersonic missiles dangerous. The fact of the matter is, a ballistic missile traveling along a predictable ballistic flight path at Mach 23 would be easier for most air defense systems to intercept than a hypersonic cruise missile traveling along at Mach 5 and maneuvering. It's in that ability to change course that modern hypersonic missiles find their value, but it's in developing and fielding that ability that they also find their immense cost. In order to build a hypersonic cruise missile, you have to design and build an advanced propulsion system that can sustain Mach 5 plus speeds an airframe with control surfaces that can actually manage course adjustments in these extreme conditions, a navigation and navionics suite capable of guiding the weapon accurately at four-digit plus ranges, and wrap it all in materials that can withstand temperatures of more than 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, and you do all that just to blow it up. Now, the truth is, overcoming some of the engineering hurdles inherent to hypersonic flight might be a bit easier in a disposable system, but the real-life costs associated with all that technology make such a weapon too expensive to be of use, except in the most extreme of cases. But if you were to take that same $100 million missile and find a way to use it twice, well, the cost of each flight just dropped to 50 million. If you could find a way to use it three times, now we're talking 33 million. And if you could find a way to use it 30 times, well, then we're talking about the cost of a Tomahawk cruise missile. That's obviously not an option for a missile designed to deliver a single warhead. But when it comes to Hermius's Dark Horse, that's exactly what we're talking about. But beyond just delivering ordnance, Dark Horse could be an invaluable part of America's future efforts to deploy and maintain combat networks, and could certainly be used as an intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance platform just like the SR-71 was decades ago, and Dark Horse could potentially do it all for about the same price as a single hypersonic missile. Or at least, that's the plan. Whether or not Hermius will be successful, I genuinely couldn't say, but after spending time with their team and seeing what they're up to, it's more evident to me than ever that hypersonics really are the future of military aviation, just not in any of the forms that people have been talking about. If Hermius does prove successful, the hypersonic arms race could soon look a lot like the space race did back in 1969. Russia and China may have fielded their hypersonic equivalents of Sputnik in their avant-garde and DF-ZF weapon systems respectively, but fielding reusable hypersonic aircraft is the moonshot of modern aviation. Because at the end of the day, when we talk about these races, it's never about who started them. It's always about who finishes. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.